Hi everyone, today we're starting chapter 1 of physics for the MCAT which covers kinematics and dynamics. Chapter 1.1 is about units. There are two common systems of units in daily life now and they're the imperial system and the metric system. The imperial system consists of the foot, the pound, and the second, also called FPS, and the metric system consists of the meter, the kilogram, and the second, also called MKS. You will almost never be asked to convert between these two systems on the MCAT because the metric system is by far the most commonly used system in science. And if, you're, if you ever are asked to convert between the two systems, you'll most likely be given the conversion factors. So in science, there's a system of units called the SI base units. And these are the units that all scientists try to use in order to have a consistent system of comparison. So the SI base unit for length is the meter, the SI unit for mass is the kilogram, the SI unit for time is the second, the SI unit for current is the amp, the SI unit for amount of substance is the mole, the SI unit for temperature is Kelvin, although Celsius is also frequently used, and the SI unit for luminous intensity is the candela. So these are your fundamental units. They're units that are defined um, with no, like they're units that are not derived from one another. These are your fundamental units. And it's important to note that the kilogram is the fundamental unit of mass and not the gram. So there are other units called SI derived units that are used very often in physics. These are units that are defined based off of the definitions of the base units. So the most important ones are force, which is in the Newton. And a Newton is one kilogram meter per second squared. It's very important to know the, um, the units for the derived units because a lot of times you can solve an equation just by knowing the units for it. So the SI unit of Newtons is kilogram meter per second squared. And so this implies that it is a kilogram times meter per second squared, which is acceleration. So F equals MA, which is true. And the SI unit for energy is the joule, which is a kilogram meter squared over second squared. So this implies that what a joule is, is a Newton times meters. And this is exactly what a joule is. Um, a, a joule is Newtons times the amount of meters that this force is applied by. The SI unit for power is the watt, and this is kilogram meters squared over seconds. So this implies that a watt is a joule per second. And this is also true of the watt. Um, I'll go into much more detail about all of these units later, but for now just know that knowing the units for things can sometimes help you as a shortcut so you can remember less equations. Chapter 1.2 is about vectors and scalars. So vectors are quantities with both a magnitude and a direction, and scalars are quantities with a magnitude only. So if I were to say that I'm running at 10 meters per second, this would be a scalar because this is a magnitude only, and this is described as speed. If I said that I was running at 10 meters per second north, this is a description of velocity, which is a vector because it has magnitude and direction. Other vectors include acceleration and displacement, and distance and time are scalars. So displacement and distance are both measures of like length, but displacement has a direction and distance doesn't. And time is a scalar because time doesn't really have a direction. Um, vectors are usually denoted in a bold letter or a bold letter with an arrow over it. So this would be velocity and this would also be velocity. The magnitude of a vector is denoted as the vector, but with these absolute value bars beside it. So the magnitude of velocity would be speed. And scalars, on the other hand, are denoted in italics. So it's really hard to write italics in handwriting, um, but just know that if you see it in italics, it's a scalar. So you can do several things with vectors. You can add and subtract them, which uses a method called tip to tail. So for example, if I wanted to add this vector A and this vector B, I would put them tip to tail. So using 
the tip of one of them and the tail of another one connect them. And this connecting line from the very beginning to the very end is the vector you would get when you added them. Um, on the other hand, if you wanted to add three vectors, A, B, and C, you can put them all tip to tail like this, or you can put them all tip to tail in a different order. It doesn't matter what order you put vectors, as long as you put all of them tip to tail in some way, you'll get the same resulting vector. Like this blue vector here and this blue vector here are the same resulting vector. If you wanted to subtract vectors, you would do the same, except the vector you're subtracting, you would turn it the opposite way. So you would flip the tip and the tail. So if like in this first example, I wanted to do A minus B, I would draw A, and then I would draw B going in the opposite direction. So B is going diagonally upwards in the original one, and to subtract B, I draw it diagonally downwards with the same magnitude. And then this resulting vector is A minus B. Like that method is great and all if you wanted to draw out the vectors and add them that way, but a lot of the times you need to know the exact values of the vectors you're adding. So if, for example, I wanted to add A and B, but I wanted to know the actual values of the resulting vector, first I would have to split both A and B into their X and Y components, um, because you can only add the X and the Y components, you can't just add the magnitude of the vectors, that would give you a totally different magnitude. So in order to split A into its X and Y components, we use some trigonometry. A here is the magnitude of vector A. So in order to get the displacement in the X, or yeah, in order to get the displacement in the X, we would do X equals A cosine theta. And in order to get the displacement in the Y, we do Y equals A, a sine theta. And we would do the same for vector B. And then we would add the X from vector A to the x from vector b, and we add the y from vector a and the y from vector b together. So this would give you the total x and the total y. So great, now we know how far it goes in the x and how far it goes in the y, but we still need to know the total magnitude of the entire vector, because when you know the x and the y, that doesn't describe the hypotenuse of the triangle here. So in order to find the hypotenuse, um, we would take the y total and the x total, and we would draw a triangle. Um, and then we would use the Pythagorean theorem, which is a squared equals b squared plus c squared, to find the magnitude of the entire vector. And to find the angle that it's going at, we can use tangent theta to find theta, where tangent theta equals y over x. Lastly, you can always multiply a vector by a scalar. So if you wanted to um, define a new vector b, which is equivalent to 3a. You just take your vector a and you multiply it by 3. You just make it 3 times as long. And if you were to multiply it by a negative number, you would have the same thing, but the tip and the tail would be reversed. Multiplying vectors by other vectors is a totally different story. So there are two types of vector multiplication. One is called the dot product, which results in a scalar, and the other is called the cross product, which makes another vector. So to calculate the dot product, you would write a dot b equals the absolute value of a times the absolute value of b cosine theta. To calculate the cross product, you would write a cross b equals the absolute value of a times the absolute value of b times sine theta. And what's important about the cross product is that the cross product has a direction. And to figure out this direction, remember that it will always be perpendicular to the plane that's defined by a and b. I'm not really good at three-dimensional drawing, but just imagine that here a and b are on the xy plane. And if a and b are both on the xy plane, then your resulting cross product will be in the z plane. And you can use the right hand rule for this, um, which just tells you that they will be perpendicular to each other. If you don't know how to do the right hand rule, it might be helpful to watch a separate video on how to do that. It's kind of hard to explain if you can't see me and my hand. So now on to some actual physics. Chapter 1.3 is about displacement and velocity. So first, displacement and velocity are both vectors. So we need to consider the direction and we don't consider the path. So what this means is that if, for example, we walk all the way around the Earth and we end up at the same spot, 
the displacement here would be zero because we started and ended at the same spot. We didn't move in any specific direction. But if we ask for the distance traveled, which doesn't consider the direction, just the total distance that we went, um, the distance traveled would be the entire circumference of the Earth. So another reason why displacement here would be zero is that as we're walking around the Earth, we're walking in opposite directions. So although we walked a lot, all of the different directions end up canceling out because we end up back in the same place. So a quantity that's helpful to calculate is instantaneous velocity. Instantaneous velocity is equal to the limit of the change in displacement over the change in time. And I doubt that you'll ever be asked to calculate a limit um, on the MCAT. So just know that if you're given a graph of displacement and time, um, know that the instantaneous velocity is the tangent at any of these points. So if you so if you were, for example, at this point, the tangent here is at a slope of zero. So right there, you have no instantaneous velocity. And that's especially important when you're thinking about throwing an object upward. So when you throw an object upward, um, it moves up and then it moves back down. So at its very peak height, when it's like completely stopped and it's not moving up or down, that has an instantaneous velocity of zero. And the average velocity is equal to the total change in um, displacement over the total change in time. So if you threw a ball upward and then it came back down, you would have an average velocity of zero because it didn't actually go anywhere. And so note that the instantaneous velocity is the same as the instantaneous speed because the in instantaneous velocity is just the instantaneous speed but with a direction. But however, the average velocity is definitely not the same as the average speed. So if we think about the example of throwing a ball upward, the average speed is not zero because the ball is moving somewhere with some speed when it's going up and it's moving somewhere with some speed when it goes down. Um, however, the instantaneous velocity is zero because the upward velocity cancels out with the downward velocity for the total path traveled. Chapter 1.4 is about forces and acceleration. So the unit of the force is the Newton, which is equal to kilogram meter per second squared. Gravitational force can be calculated with this equation here, which says that gravitational force is equal to some gravitational constant times the mass of the first object times the mass of the second object divided by radius squared. So what this equation means is that these two masses are exerting a gravitational force on each other um, multiplied by a constant g, and this force is divided by radius squared. I don't think you'll be asked to calculate the exact gravitational force on the MCAT. However, do know the relationships between these variables. So if you increase the radius by a factor of two, gravitational force will decrease by one fourth because the radius term is squared. However, if you increase the mass of one of the objects by twice, the gravitational force will also increase by two. The normal force is the force between any two objects. Um, so in order to calculate normal force, we should know that the acceleration due to gravity of any object on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. So what normal force means is, I've drawn an example here. So this box, which is 10 kilograms, is resting on the ground. Um, the gravitational force here is 9.8 meters per second squared times 10 kilograms. So the downward force of gravity is 98 newtons. And the normal force is the force between the two objects, so the ground and this object here. So if we know that gravity is pulling down at 98 newtons and this block like isn't going anywhere, the ground must also be exerting an upward force of 98 newtons. And more specifically, this downward gravitational force should be negative, and the normal force will be positive 98 newtons upwards. It's not always as straightforward to calculate the normal force between two objects, because if you had, for example, an inclined plane, your normal force, which is always perpendicular to the surface that the two objects are touching, 
will be upward to the right in this direction, but the gravitational force is going straight down. So these are not going to be exactly equal to each other. And how you would calculate the normal force in this scenario is you would use the equation F equals mg cosine theta. In this equation, the theta refers to the angle between the vector of the gravitational force and the vector of the normal force. So to make this equation a little bit more intuitively understandable, um, I'm going to rotate this whole picture a little bit. Um, so like what we did earlier with vector, with like dividing a vector into the x and y forces, this is kind of like the same thing with that. So we know that negative 98 newtons is the total amount of force that we need to counteract because this block isn't moving right now. Um, so the mg cosine, the cosine theta term, when cosine is greater than 90 degrees, which here it clearly is, um, it becomes negative. And so this vector here, like this whole expression will become positive um, because 98 newtons, negative 98 newtons is negative and cosine theta will be negative. So if we draw the gravitational force vector in the other direction, um, we can see that we need to split this into an x component and into a y component. Um, this vector isn't to scale because the normal force will always be smaller than the gravitational force because we're splitting the gravitational force into its x and y components. So you can see here that this, um, this vector for the normal force will be the x. So this will be cosine theta. The next type of force is friction, and friction is the force that directly opposes movement. And there are two types of friction. They are known as static and kinetic. So static friction is denoted by F sub S, and static friction is the friction that occurs before an object even starts moving. So if you envision pushing a really heavy box across some carpet, you'll need to apply a lot of force before the box starts moving at all. And what is causing the box to not be able to move until you apply a lot of force is static friction. So static friction can occupy a whole range of values. They range from zero, all the way until a constant called u sub s times normal force. And u sub s is a coefficient named the coefficient of static friction. So when you first start trying to push this really heavy box, initially there is no static friction on the box. And as you increase the amount of force that you apply, if the box still isn't moving, the amount of static friction increases. So there is more force trying to oppose you pushing the box and this static friction will continue to increase when you apply more force to it until eventually you reach the upper limit which is u sub s times the normal force and once you reach this limit the object can start moving so once the object is moving there's still friction that opposes the object and this is called kinetic friction and kinetic friction doesn't occupy a whole range of values kinetic friction is always going to be F sub k, which is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. And there are two things that are important about the difference between static friction and kinetic friction. The first is that static friction is always, the coefficient of static friction is always going to be greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction. And this kind of makes sense. So if you think about pushing this really heavy box on the carpet, you will often notice that it takes you more force to get the box to start moving and it feels easier once the box is already moving. And this is because static friction is going to be greater than kinetic friction. The second difference is that kinetic friction is always going to be the same for this object. Um, it doesn't depend on any other factors, it only depends on the coefficient and the normal force. So it doesn't matter how like big the object is, it doesn't matter what shape it is, but on the other hand, static friction can be different depending on the shape and the size of the object. So if you had a box that wasn't exactly um, a cube, like it was rectangular, if you lie it down with more surface area touching the carpet, this would cause more static friction. But if you lie it down 
with the thinner end touching the carpet, this would cause less static friction. But this isn't a factor in kinetic friction. In kinetic friction, it only depends on the normal force times this coefficient. Another concept in this section is the difference between mass and weight. So mass is intrinsic to an object, and mass is usually measured in kilograms. So the mass of an object is just a property of the object, and it doesn't matter where this object is. However, weight is also a function of gravity. So if you had a 10 kilogram box, this 10 kilogram box would be 10 kilograms, whether it was on Earth or it, if it was on the moon. However, this 10 kilogram box would have a different weight if it was on Earth, and it would be lighter in weight if it was on the moon. Weight is calculated by Fg equals mg, um, so it's a measure of the gravity's pull on your particular object. The center of mass of an object is not always at the geometric center. I've drawn two people here to help you visualize this, so this person's center of mass is going to be here, and this person's center of mass is going to be a bit lower because he has different proportions. So how you would calculate the center of mass of an object is with this formula here. Um, I highly doubt you will ever encounter this formula, but how you would use it is, so say I have a flower with four petals, um, and I can label these petals one, two, three, and four. Petal one would have a certain location called X1, and it would have a certain mass called m1. It would also have a y coordinate as well as a z coordinate. So you would apply this formula by multiplying the mass of each petal by the location of each petal and adding all of these together and dividing it by all of the masses of all of the petals combined. And you would want to do the same for the y coordinates as well as the z coordinates. And once you calculate this for x, y, and z, you have the exact coordinates of the center of mass. Another concept is acceleration. So acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. And it's given by delta v over delta t equals acceleration. So one way to measure acceleration is by instantaneous acceleration, which is the acceleration at a certain moment in time. And you can find that, like how you found instantaneous velocity, with a limit. You can also find it on a graph if you plotted change in velocity and change in time. And you had a curve. And you would find the instantaneous velocity. You would find the instantaneous acceleration by the tangents to this curve. Another measure of acceleration is average acceleration. So to find this, you would just have to take the total change in velocity over a given period of time divided by the total change in time. This video is getting kind of long, so I'll be recording a part two of it and I'll be uploading it very, very shortly. And once again, thank you so much for watching and I hope this helped you out.